So I'm pleased to be able to introduce our first speaker of the morning. Two years ago here at the OFH conference and annual general meeting, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry announced a new partnership with the OFH to deliver the Community Hatchery Program. I am extremely proud of what the Community Hatchery Program has accomplished during the past two years. The evolution of this program would not have been possible without the leadership and dedication of our next presenter. Shane Wood has been the coordinator of the Community Hatchery Program since the beginning, and his efforts have quickly turned an idea into an extremely successful program. Shane has a BSc in Environmental Resource Science from Trent University and an Environmental Technology Diploma from Durham College. And he has a diversity of experience in fisheries management. From small pothole lakes in Alberta to the Great Lakes in Ontario, Shane has spent the majority of his career working directly with recreational fisheries and anglers. Drawing on these experiences and a strong passion for fishing and hunting, Shane has been a great addition to the Community Hatchery Program and to the OFH team. To tell us more about Ontario's community hatcheries and the achievements of the Community Hatchery Program, please welcome Shane Wood. All right, thanks, Matt. And uh, thanks to everybody uh, this morning for getting up early and attending uh, the first talk this morning. When, uh, when Matt first uh, approached me about uh, presenting at this event, I didn't get that normal rush of anxiety or nervousness when you're asked to speak in front of a large crowd. I was actually excited to have the opportunity to uh, share with everybody the many benefits that community hatcheries provide and also what the CHP has accomplished in its first two years of operations. So today I'll be giving you a quick overview of fish stocking in Ontario, uh, which will include highlights from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry fish stocking program, as well as community hatchery fish stockings. I'll also highlight community hatcheries and the many benefits that they provide. And lastly, I'll provide the highlights of what the community hatchery program has accomplished to date and explain its role in supporting community-based fish culture operations. So first, just a quick uh, overview of fish stocking in Ontario. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, they operate nine provincial fish culture stations around the province. They currently raise 12 different fish species. They stock over 8 million fish into 1,200 water bodies each year, including the Great Lakes. They currently maintain 18 genetically distinct, distinct brood stocks. And they're also experimenting uh, with the culture of aquatic species at risk. And lastly but not least, they also provide community hatcheries with millions of eggs and fry each year for community hatchery operations. So this may be kind of a familiar story that many of you have already heard before or read about, but what many of you may not know is that for decades, community hatcheries have been complementing the ministry's fish stocking program by raising and stocking public fish for public waters to create and maintain angling opportunities through put, grow, and take fish stocking programs to rehabilitate native species populations, and to conserve unique low net, local genetic strains. These are all volunteer-operated hatcheries, and they all have the same common goal, which is to conserve their local fisheries. An example of one community hatchery's mission statement that's posted on their, uh, on their website is to engage the community in the management and stewardship of local fisheries resources and to ensure they are available for the enjoyment and, and use of present and future generations to raise local fish for local waters. I think this mission state statement resonates with all of us here today as we all want to help conserve our natural resources both for the present and future generations. So where are community hatcheries operating on the landscape? So currently we have about 50 community hatcheries that operate each year in Ontario. Roughly half of those hatcheries are raising walleye and the other half are raising salmon and trout species. The majority of the walleye hatcheries are operating in that greater Sudbury area, while the salmon and trout hatcheries are dotted along the Ontario shores of the Great Lakes, with the exception of the two community hatcheries there in the Bancroft district who are raising lake trout for stocking inland waters. And then last but not least, we've got the sole community hatchery that's raising muskellunge, which is the partnership hatchery between Muskies Canada and Sir Sanford Fleming College who are raising muskie for the Lake Simcoe Muskie Restoration Program. And when I talk about community hatcheries, there's large variation in their size, their complexity, their production capabilities, and the overall scope of their operations. 
The majority of cuny hatcheries are what we would consider small scale. They're typically the size of a one or two car garage or smaller. And they ha only have the capacity to raise fish to that fry or fingerling life stage. But on the flip side, we have a large number of cuny hatcheries that are significantly larger than a two car garage. And these facilities have the capacity to raise larger quantities of those fingerling sized fish and even rear fish to the yearling or sub adult life stages. And under the CUNY hatchery umbrella, we also include nursery nets, which is a picture on the left. Um, an example is United Fish and Game Clubs of Manitoulin are using nursery nets to rear walleye directly in Lake Kekwag. We also include rearing ponds, which is a picture on the top right, where virtually all walleye CUNY hatcheries are operating rearing ponds to raise walleye to that sum summer fingering life stage. And under the Community Action Umbrella, we also include the Chinook Salmon Pen Project, where community volunteers are using net pens as a stocking technique to imprint fish and grow fish larger before the release into Lake Ontario. But regardless of the size or complexity of all the community hatcheries, they're all operated by community volunteers and they're raising public fish for public waters. So now you have an idea of what community hatcheries look like. Um, so what do they actually raise and, and what do they stock? So cutie hatcheries stock millions of fish every year into roughly 100 lakes and rivers. These fish vary in species and developmental life stage from three to four day old walleye fry right up to two plus year old rainbow trout. And in the last two years, CHP funded hatcheries have stocked 13.7 million fish in 2013 and 9.5 million fish in 2014, which is above the long-term average. And to date, CUNY hatcheries have stocked an impressive 235 million fish into Ontario lakes and rivers. But one thing to, uh, to keep in mind is when you're reading uh, stocking summaries, is when the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry produce fish stocking summaries, they do not include fish stocked as those earlier life stages, such as fry. Whereas when the CHP um, produces a stocking summary, we include all life stages, include those early life stages as fry, as we recognize that those fish still require volunteer time and effort and money to produce. So when you read these summaries, a lot of times you're not really comparing apples to apples. So what do community hatcheries raise? What species? So currently community hatcheries raise nine different fish species, uh, which includes seven salmon and trout species, and two cool water species, which is walleye and, and muscalunge. Walleye and rainbow trout uh, are the two dominant species and make up the majority of the community hatchery fish production. The differences in the fish production there between 2013 and 2014 is contributed to the variability of walleye production. Walleye are notoriously hard to consistently raise, unlike salmon and trout species, and I'll give you an example of, uh, of what I mean. So if I go back and if I just plot salmon and trout species stocked by community hatcheries, the production has been fairly consistent, especially over the last uh, 15 years. Within 2013 and 2014, community hatcheries have stocked 1.3 million salmon and trout. But community hatcheries provide many additional benefits on top of raising and stocking fish that help conserve our fisheries resource. Community hatcheries also double as community learning centers. It's actually surprising how many community volunteers come from an educational background, and it just seems to be in their nature where they want to educate the local youth and the general public about natural resources conservation and management. Um, I was out visiting uh, Hatchery there last month and we're meeting some Hatchery volunteers. And one of the Hatchery volunteers was my old elementary public school uh, principal. I won't get into details why he knew who I was. But, uh, <laughs> so just, uh, just to give you some prime examples of what I mean by a, a community learning center, if you look at the picture there on the left with the news article, uh, the Little Current Fish and Game Club have been operating an educational program since 2005, where each spring, um, students from area public schools and First Nation elementary schools experience a field trip to the walleye hatchery. And they get to learn hands-on how the conservation and preservation of their watershed benefits the whole overall community. Another example is the picture on the right is the North Hastings Community Fish Hatchery where they work with local area schools that have two of their outdoor educational programs participate in hatchery operations. 
So every week, students from these programs get to take a trip to the, the hatchery and participate in general hatchery operations, such as fish inventory, cleaning of tanks, general maintenance, fish feeding, and so on. And it's through these programs that these students get to learn about fish ecology, fisheries management, and many other key life skills. But not only do community hatcheries provide educational programs at the facilities, some community hatcheries are taking their educational outreach directly into local schools. The picture on the left here is volunteers for the United Walleye Clubs and the Trailsman Rod and Gun Club. They go around and visit area kindergarten schools with microscopes and fertilized walleye eggs to show the students developing eggs. Another example is a picture on the right is where the Lake, Hur Lake Huron Fish and Game Club have been operating a Schnook Salmon Classroom Hatchery for the last five years. And currently, hatchery volunteers run this program in 21 area different schools. I know my kids are in that kindergarten age, and if they ever seen developing eggs under a microscope, they'd be talking about them for months. Community hatcheries also get communities engaged in fisheries management and conservation. And they achieve this through community hatchery organized events, such as hatchery open houses, kids events, fundraising derbies, um, fundraising dinners, fishing derbies, and large stocking events. And this community involvement brings the community together to be better stewards of their watersheds. So with the support from their local community, many community hatcheries are active with land stewardship activities and fisheries improvement projects. These include fish, fish passage, uh, fish spawning habitat improvements, tree planting, bank stabilization, and stream restoration. So just one point to kind of highlight that community hatcheries do a lot more for conservation than just stocking fish is that the OFH Mary Pickford Award, um, which is the oldest and most sought after OFH club award, that it gets awarded to the club that is considered to do the most for conservation in the last year, has been awarded to an OFH club that has operated community hatchery an impressive 16 times since 1981. So this just goes to show you that community hatcheries do a lot more for conservation than just stock fish, but it's the hatchery operations that are at the heart of all the stewardship activities. So recognizing the many benefits that community hatcheries provide, the OFH was excited to have the opportunity to partner with the Ministry of Natural Reserves and Forestry in 2013 to administer a community hatchery program that will support community-based fish culture operations in Ontario. So in this last section of my presentation, I just want to provide some quick highlights and accomplishments that the CHP has achieved during its first two years of operation. So first, just to give you a quick history on how community hatcheries have been uh, funded in the past. So community-based fish culture activities have been receiving funding support through a dedicated program since the early 1980s. And it all started in 1981 when the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry launched a community fisheries involvement program. The ministry also went out to roll out a community involvement program that was dedicated specific to wildlife and habitat in 1985. And these two programs merged in 1992 to create the Community Fisheries and Wildlife Involvement Program known as CFWIP. Then in March 2013, the OFH and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry entered into a three-year transfer of payment agreement to establish a community hatchery program. So up until 2013, community hatcheries have roughly received between sixty and $70,000 in funding support through these dedicated programs. Then in 2013, the CHP provided a total of $144,580 to community hatcheries for their operations. And in 2014, the program was able to award $151,611 in total CHP funding. So CHP is providing community hatcheries with more than double the amount of funding support than they've ever received through a dedicated funding program. But not only is the CHP providing historical levels of funding, the program has also improved the way that funding is allocated. 
So one of the first things that the CHP did was look into ways to improve the historical funding formula, which previous programs funded community hatcheries based on the number of species re reared. So therefore, the more species that a hatchery raised, the greater funding support they'd be eligible for, regardless of the species, the developmental life stage that they stocked at, or the total numbers of their production. And that was allocated at a maximum of $1,000 per species. So if a community hatchery is only raising Chinook salmon, they'd be eligible for $1,000. If they're raising rainbow trout, brown trout, and brook trout, they'd be eligible for $3,000. But recognizing that there's a large difference in the cost to rear different develop developmental life stages, like a fry versus a, a yearling, and even the difference in rearing different uh, species, the OFH, in collaboration with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and its fish culture section, developed a new CHP funding formula that was production-based. This new funding formula takes into consideration the species, developmental life stage, and the total number of fish stocked by each hatchery. And I'll give you an example just to illustrate uh, the differences between the two funding uh, allocation models. So we've got three scenarios here. In each of the scenarios, a community hatchery is raising 10,000 rainbow trout. The only difference is the developmental life stage of which these hatcheries are stocking their fish at. Fish at. In scenario A, hatcheries are stocking fry. In scenario B, the hatcheries are stocking fingerlings. And in example C, the hatchery is stocking yearlings. So using the historical funding model, but you, the one that was used by CFWIP, in each of these scenarios, community hatcheries would have been eligible for the same amount of funding support, which would have been $1,000 per species. But using the new production-based formula, the hatcheries that are rearing the more advanced life stages would be eligible for greater funder su funding support based on the proportional differences of the estimated cost to raise each of these life stages. So how are hatcheries spending this money, or how are they using their allocated funding? So CHP funding goes directly to hatcheries to offset their general cost of their operation of raising fish, such as fish feed, uh, hatchery supplies, um, hydro, etc. But what it really means is CH funding, CHP funding is helping hatcheries to maintain their current operations, or essentially what we call keeping their lights on. But community hatcheries don't just need funding support for general operations. Many hatcheries need capital improvements to maintain or improve their operation to continually successfully raising fish. So because some of these hatcheries have been operating since the 80s, um, there are in need of some capital improvements to continue their operations. So therefore, the CHP sets aside a portion of funding each year to help fund capital improvement projects that will improve community hatcheries and their operations and support them in meeting their approved production targets. Every hatchery has the opportunity to apply for a CHP capital improvement grant that will improve their fish culture operations. And last year, the program awarded 19 community hatcheries with $46,000 in CHP capital improvement grants. So just kind of give you some examples of what those capital improvement projects were that got funded last year. Uh, were new rearing tanks, infra infrastructure upgrades such as a new roof, basic water quality monitoring equipment, and other key essential uh, hatchery equipment. So therefore, essentially, the community hatchery has two pools of funding that community hatcheries can apply for. The first pool being the CHP funding, uh, which helps cover general operational cost, uh, keeping the lights on, as, as we've referred it to. But then community hatcheries can also apply for funding through a CHP capital improvement grant to complete projects that will improve their hatchery operations and help them to continually successfully raise fish. And these two pools combined, the CHP provides up to $150,000 in funding support each year. And just to remind, this is over double what hatcheries have ever received through a previous funding program. But community hatcheries require additional support other than just monetary funding. Hatcheries occasionally require technical support or hatchery operational guidance. So to deliver this support, the CHP has established a community of practice that shares the knowledge, resources, and experiences among all community hatcheries. 
There are already some, or there have been some, already established small networks where community hatcheries in their local area have already established, and they're working quite well. But it's the CHP's goal to broaden that networking to a provincial level. And I'll illustrate, uh, illustrate what, I, what I mean by that. So if we use uh, walleye, hatchery as, walleye hatchery as an example, there's walleye clubs that operate in the greater sub area that have already established a strong networking system where all the hatcheries work together and they help each other out to meet all of their production goals. And that same goes with the walleye hatcheries operating north of Kingston and then the three that are operating in the St. Catharines area. But through the CHP, the goal is to build that provincial network and connect all hatcheries together and all these established networks together to help support the transfer of knowledge, resources, and experiences among all community hatcheries. So one component of the community of practice is for the CHP to host or to support community hatcheries and hosting community hatchery workshops. These workshops provide a platform to provide targeted technical support and it aids in the establishment of a provincial community hatchery network. Some examples of the two most recent uh, CHP uh, workshops is the, uh, the pictures on the left was a fish disease workshop that was held at the University of Guelph where hatchery volunteers received some hands-on experiences on how to recognize the common symptoms of fish pathogens. And then earlier this month, the CHP held a walleye culture information session at the OFH Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center where walleye hatcheries volunteers received some helpful hints and tricks on how to successfully raise walleye. The CHP has also uh, been successful in acting as a central clearinghouse to oversee the transfer of unused hatchery equipment from one hatchery to another. Because many of these hatcheries have been operating for decades, they've also gone through some hatchery upgrades uh, throughout the years. So this has resulted in some pieces of equipment that are essentially collecting dust or have been left outside just to uh, be exposed to the elements. So the CHP has helped these hatcheries to offload these pieces of unutilized equipment that are in still good working order to find a new home and another hatchery and can get put to good use. And just some examples of pieces of equipment that the CHP has helped transfer to date are egg, incuba egg incubation towers and trays, uh, fish tanks, troughs, and walleye bell jars. The CHP has also la launched a website this past summer, and the website serves uh, a dual purpose. It's designed to promote the program, but it's also designed to act as a central resource center for community hatcheries. So under the resource section, community hatcheries can access information on additional funding opportunities, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, fish culture, best management practices, fish health, and much more. We've also incorporated a dedicated hatchery forum into the website where this form provides a direct line of communication among all community hatchery volunteers. The website has also built in some features to help promote and highlight community hatcheries themselves. And one tool that's become very useful to us is this interactive uh, Google map, where it displays all the community hatcheries that are operating in and around uh, in Ontario. And if you scroll through the map and you cl actually click on the blue fish icons, a hockey card style profile or a hatchery profile will pop up. And in this profile it includes information on the hatchery species that it rears, uh, their water bodies that they stock, uh, gives information on when and how you can visit the hatchery if you'd like to visit the hatchery, and also provides contact information um, to hatchery volunteers if you want to be interested in uh, volunteering with the hatchery or even finding out more about their operations. And then another feature that the website also um, has is a community hatchery events calendar where here we can, pr we can profile community hatchery organized events such as fundraising dinners, kids events, volunteer days, fish derbies and much more. But this website is part of a larger program initiative to promote the CHP and highlight the many benefits of community-based fish culture.
The CHP has and will continue to use all OFH communication outlets, outlets to promote the program and highlight community hatcheries. And to expand its profile to a large audience, the CHP has also entered into the social media craze with the use of Facebook. And just to highlight the, the effectiveness of uh, social media, earlier this week I, um, I did a Facebook post about how spring is the busiest month the, for, or the busiest time of year for many community hatcheries. And if they were interested in getting involved to, to explore that Google map that I spoke uh, about uh, a few minutes ago and to find out uh, where hatcheries are operating in their local area and if they were interested in getting involved to either contact me or use the contact information on the, uh, on the interactive Google map. And then I spent the next two days responding to dozens and dozens of emails and Facebook messages from people who wanted to get involved in the program and find out more how they can help out with the local community hatchery. But without the use of social media, I think it would have been hard to reach out to such a large audience in such a quick, quick time period. And I think this past week I've probably responded to more inquiries about uh, community hatcheries than I have in the first whole two years combined. So social media is going to play a big part on helping to promote the program moving forward. So in conclusion, what are the key take-home messages I'd like everybody to, to leave here with today? So first is that community hatcheries stock millions of fish each year to help create and maintain angling opportunities through put, grow, and take fish stocking programs, to rehabilitate native species populations, and to conserve unique fish genetic strains. But these fish don't raise themselves. So hundreds of dedicated volunteers, some of which are in the audience today, spend over 70,000 hours raising and stocking fish to do their part to conserve our fisheries. Community hatcheries do a lot more than just stock fish. They also double as community learning centers. And they're, they're, at, they're at the center of many watershed stewardship activities within their local communities. The OFH, in partnership with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, that administer a community hatchery program to support community hatcheries in Ontario by providing two important pieces of the puzzle to the successful operations of community-based fish culture in Ontario. The program provides record levels of funding assistance that will aid in general hatchery operational costs and capital improvement projects, and it provides technical support and hatchery operational guidance through the establishment of a community of practice. So the CHP has accomplished a lot in its first years of operation, and it's well on its way to establishing a long-term program that supports community hatcheries to successfully raise public fish for public waters for many years to come. So if you'd like to find out more or how, you, how to get involved, uh, you can visit us online at www.communityhatcheries.com or follow us on Facebook. I just want to end with uh, one last thing. Um, I can relate to what Shane Mahoney said yesterday and how it was his encounters with wildlife um, that had shaped him. And I believe for a long time that it wasn't my education or where I was raised. It was those summers spent fishing with my grandfather that kind of molded me into the person I am today. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all those community hatchery volunteers that are in the audience today for dedicating their time and effort and all their hard work to help conserve those hanging opportunities that have shaped so many of us. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Shane. And I, I think we do actually have uh, some time for questions. So if anyone has any questions for Shane, you can step up to the mic. Uh, Shane, uh, Frank Weck from Ajax. Uh, Shane, congratulations on your role. Uh, for the past couple of years in the office, you're doing a great job. Uh, and I want to thank you on behalf of all the uh, people who angle in Ontario and will do in the future because you're making a difference. Can you explain uh, how a school, for example, or a lo small local club could get startup funding to run a classroom hatchery? Is that available through your program? So currently the CHP is not set up to fund classroom hatcheries. It's to set up to fund 
existing established community hatcheries. Um, so we've only got a limited amount of funding, um, and we, we recognize the importance of classroom hatcheries, but to expand the program at this time would be too large. Yeah, okay. <laughs> any, any more questions for Shane? Um, Nick's going. So, someone's going? Nick from Blue Water. My name is Dick Bournet, uh, president of Blue Water Anglers, uh, Sarnia. Our hatchery is in Point Edward, uh, right at the uh, mouth of the St. Clair River. Uh, the gentleman that asked about the uh, uh, school, classroom yeah. school programs, uh, we just had a gentleman come from King Carden that talked to us about that. We're, we're thinking of doing two schools in Sarnia, so we're in the process of getting that done. So if he wants to give me his email address, I'll send him some information as to who to contact. And that is set up through Ontario Power Generation uh, and there is, there is some information there, and uh, certainly I think this gentleman could probably help him, so. Thanks, Frank. So that, is that it for questions? Anyone else have anything that they, they want to ask of Shane? Now's the chance. He's on the hot seat. You okay, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> So thank you, Shane. I, I think that um, you know we would all agree that the CHP in its first two years has been incredibly successful, and I think I speak on behalf of the OFH, um, on behalf of the MNRF, and community hatcheries as well, in saying that the CHP has really exceeded our expectations in what we've been able to accomplish. And when we say the CHP, the CHP is Shane. He is a one-man show. Um, and he takes care of everything within the program. And so I think there's a lot to be said for uh, Shane's leadership with that program. And I think that we look forward as OFAH, working with the MNRF and community hatcheries to make this a long-standing program because I think it's very important for fisheries management in Ontario and there's a lot of history.